you to welcome back to the Sunrise Morning Show, Richard Gazelle, Executive Director of In Defense of Christians. Rich, good morning. Happy Easter. Good morning, Annie. Happy Easter to you, too. Thank you very much. Now, um, that the happy part of our conversation, uh, not much more happy news to uh, talk about in uh, in the segment that we have today because we are coming up on a rather somber anniversary that of the abduction of two Syrian bishops. Can you remind us of this story? Well, certainly. Um, Archbishops Hanna Ibrahim and Paul Yazdi were abducted uh, on April 22nd in 2013. We're coming up now, as you said, on the ninth anniversary. They were abducted while they were out in the countryside outside Aleppo, Syria, on mission to negotiate for the release of two other uh, previously abducted priests. Uh, upon the hostile encounter with their abductors, their security detail, as well as accompanying detail, uh, deacons were, were shot and killed on the scene while the archbishops themselves were taken alive. It's still unknown, in fact, who the responsible parties were for the abduction, abduction of the bishops. However, there is some reasonable theories being investigated. Uh, it's most likely that they were abducted by fundamentalist jihadist groups, either ISIS or one of the many splinter groups uh, in Syria. It's also possible that they were taken by a Turkish proxy group. But regardless who's responsible for the kidnapping, one thing is for sure, that Archbishops Ibrahim and, and Yazi represent the very best in the heart and soul of Christianity in Syria um, for their faith and their service. And uh, for nearly a decade, uh, the Archbishops have most likely been subjected to severe torture and certainly have had their faith tested. Um, and unfortunately, we don't know their fate or their current status. Uh, so while we continue to pray for their safe return, we also rejoice in the possibility that they're with our Lord. Wow. I was going to ask if there is any evidence that they're still alive. I guess we don't know one way or the other. It's been a number of years since we've had any uh, indication or, or any um, any signs of life for sure, but even any indication from government government authorities uh, as to what their status is. It's been probably about five or more years. Well, let's talk a little bit more about each of them. Tell us more about Archbishop Ibrahim first. Well, certainly. Um, Archbishop Ibrahim uh, was the Syriac Orthodox Archbishop of Aleppo. Uh, he received a theology degree from St. Ephraim Theological Seminary in Lebanon, followed by um, uh, a degree from the Pontifical Oriental Institute in Rome. And finally, he, he got his Ph.D. in the U.K., he wrote his dissertation on Christianity in Mesopotamia before Islam. Um, uh, after completing his studies, he was ordained to the priesthood and then, of course, became archbishop in 1979 and has served the Syriac community in Aleppo ever since. In 1988, he established a Syriac publishing house, which has been responsible for the publication of thousands of works in the Aramaic language of our Lord. Um, he's also served on the executive committee for the Middle East Council of Churches and the Central Committee for the World Council of Churches. So he, as you can imagine, you know, by his, from his biography, he's made a huge impact on the Syrian Christian community through his career, and his loss has certainly uh, taken a toll on his flock. No doubt. Now tell us more about Archbishop Yazigi. Well, Archbishop Yazji was the Greek Antiochian uh, Archbishop of, of Aleppo. Um, he's a civil engineer by training, um, followed by his theological studies uh, in Greece. Uh, he was ordained to the priesthood in 1992 and then became Archbishop of Aleppo in 2000. Uh, he comes from a pious Christian family. In fact, his brother, in fact, is the Greek Antiochian patriarch, John X. Uh, so as I said, these two men of faith, both uh, Ibrahim and Yazji, represent the heart and soul of Christianity in Syria. Now, let's talk about what's going on in Syria in general. I mean, nine years these two men of God have been missing, and they were out searching for others who had been kidnapped. So, wow. I mean, this has been such a long time coming that Christians have been persecuted in Syria amid the, the, the time of the Syria, Syrian civil war. That's correct. With, with the Syrian civil war now approaching its 12th year, the number of radical groups running around is absolutely mind-blowing. And the dangerous part is allegiances between these groups shift almost daily in some cases. And because of this, the situation is incredibly treacherous for Christians in Syria. Uh, it's troubling for both the Christians and their welfare as individuals, of course, um, and also due to the fact that Christians in Syria constitute one of the first Gentile Christian communities in the world many of whom still speak the Aramaic language of Jesus. So the grim reality is these communities could go extinct in our lifetime, Annie. 
And, you know, one important point, you know, and this goes for the Christians of Syria, as well as the Christians in the greater Middle East, is the fact that for 2,000 years, Christians of the Middle East have perpetually been caught between warring factions. Uh, they've always been sandwiched between enemies and con- conquesting empires. They've always been caught in the crossfire, never been in a position to write their own fate or destiny. And the Syrian civil war is just one recent example of this, of this unfortunate phenomenon. Um, but Christians have been, you know, as you know, as many of your listeners know, in the center of Islam's crosshairs. But, you know, much more blood has been spilled, even in conflicts that Christians have had nothing to do with. You know, we talk about Sunni versus Shia, Turks versus Kurds, the Arab-Israeli conflict. It's Christians who have always paid the heavy toll in these scenarios. Yeah, yeah, getting caught in the crossfire. So it's been 12 years of the Syrian civil war. We're talking about two bishops who were abducted about nine years ago. I mean, has anything improved in, in more recent days? Well, you know, as, as the civil war has played out, of course, Annie, the, the Syrian regime has taken control of, of much of Syria once again. Now, the Syrian regime is not innocent by any stretch. They're, they're responsible for unthinkable crimes against humanity. But one thing is for sure, the, 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 the reality is that in often cases, and in many cases, Christians are probably safer in regime-held territories um, because the government has shown that, you know, if you are loyal to me, I will treat you well. Now, of course, that's no way to, to, to live. That's no way to sure. exist. But when it comes to day-to-day security, that sometimes has to be the trade-off. Mm-hmm. And now when you look in other parts of Syria that are controlled by Turkey, uh, it's incredibly difficult for Christians to the point of, you know, genocide. Um, you look in the northeast, however, uh, uh, part of the country that's controlled by a democratic uh, uh, autonomous government, you see, again, religious freedom, pluralism, um, and gender mm-hmm. equality taking root there. So different parts of the country have different uh, different uh, levels of security for Christians. Yeah, we've had Nadine Manza on to talk about that northeast region before and what a, uh, what a great example it could be for the rest of the Middle East. Just one last question before we let you go, Rich, because, I mean, we're, we've been talking about Archbishops Paul Yazgi and Hana Ibrahim, um, who were abducted nine years ago or nearly nine years ago, the anniversary coming up soon here of their abduction. Um, and obviously, I would think that church leaders have a huge target on their backs, as they always have in times of persecution of Christians. But are everyday Christians, just the, the regular laity, are they at risk as well? They're very much at risk, Annie. Um, not only are they, risk, are they at risk for religious persecution for their Christian faith, but 90% of, of, of civilian Syria today is below the poverty line, unable to put food on their table. Uh, so this is a huge risk. Again, being persecuted for your faith is bad enough, but if you can't feed your children, um, it, it makes it that much more difficult to, to persevere in the face of religious persecution. So this is something we're very watchful for, um, we're very active on, but we're also prayer, prayerful for at the same time. Uh, both for the welfare of our clergy who are, who, are, who are abducted, as well as for the faithful trying to remain strong in their faith. And I know you all are doing everything you can in Washington to advocate for these persecuted Christians in Syria and all over the world. You can find In Defense of Christians linked at sunrisemorningshow.com. Rich Gazelle, thank you so much. Thank you, Annie. Have a great day. You do the same. Thank you.